In the mornings, my brother, sister, and I would beg on the platform at Grand Central Station. In the mornings, because people are more generous before they've had a bad day. And on Grand Central platform, because that's where we lived, amongst hundreds of other homeless families. On this particular morning, I was about four. It is burnt into my memory. The crowd parted a few feet in front of me on the PAC concourse and came back together behind me as I held my hands out. No one looked at me. I was invisible. The message was crystal clear. My family and my life did not matter. I was covered in sores all over my face and body. I smelled rank having not showered. I would have avoided me. I can understand why other people did. But it was the occasional generosity of perfect strangers that determined whether or not we ate and survived another day. Today in America, 8.4 million children live in poverty like this. And the twin for so many of them to that poverty will be foster care. We can interrupt the cycle of poverty to foster care to poverty by investing in the foster care system. How? First, we need to recruit more middle-class foster parents. How do we do this? We remove the financial barriers that hold so many of them back from fostering. Second, we must not emancipate foster kids to homelessness. We can support them by building dorms at community colleges so they emancipate to a future. Finally, social workers. We must support social workers and modernize the tools that they have at their disposal to do the vital work that they do every day. Behind me, the stadium holds 41,549 souls. Picture 10 times that. That is the population today of America's foster care system. Yet it is more. 700,000 foster children move through the system each year, disproportionately people of color. Where are they going? What is happening to them? Not good things. 10 years before I was born, we chose to go to the moon. We made a choice and we did that. That power is in our grasp. The spirit we have as a country to do anything we choose to is right there. We must choose to end child poverty by investing in foster care. I entered foster care when I was 12 years old, having survived the abuse and near death at the hands of my mother. I thought I was saved. Almost immediately, the violence began. My first placement in foster care was a congregate care setting for young adult offenders that were too violent to be put into normal foster homes. I was placed there because I was gay. The depravity and violence that then unfolded are hard to fathom or share with you. From placement to placement, I careened from one type of torture to another for years until I was saved by one foster family. Holly and Steve were middle-class people. They weren't foster parents, but they saw what I was undergoing in these placements, and they raised their hand. They stepped up as the parent of two young people with very little resource, and they said, I will foster this young man. They saved me. We must recruit more foster parents from the middle class, like Holly and Steve. Why don't they do it today? What is holding them back? Much of it is financial. What if we provided them a pension after five years of good service? What if their kids went to college for free? What if we gave them health insurance as if they were a postal worker? All of a sudden, the financial barriers that hold so many good people back from fostering are removed. And the crop of these people would grow, and the warehousing of children would diminish. It's shocking in the United States of America that 8.4 million children live in poverty, but not since 1999 has the phrase child poverty been uttered at a presidential debate. We collectively flow around this issue as a society, ignoring it like the people ignored me and my family at Grand Central. We can make a different choice. We can choose to stop, look directly at these young people, and tell them their lives matter. They are not disposable. How? We must unleash their future. We must interrupt this generational cycle of poverty and violence by giving them a chance to secure a future through education. Today, we emancipate foster youth to hopelessness and hopelessness. At 18 or 21, we escort them to the streets, and we expect them to live 
and thrive. Were you ready to conquer the world at 18? And Foss youth, who suffer PTSD at twice the rate of American veterans of war, what do we expect? We can make a different choice. It's as if we own an automobile factory that's putting cars on the road with no engine. And yet, the engine factory is right there. Let's connect them. What if we gave Foss youth the engine they need to be successful? An education. We could build dorms at community colleges. We could emancipate Foss youth into a two-year vocational or transfer degree with housing and co-locate mental health and other services so that they thrive and break the cycle of poverty. We can make that choice. Upon exiting foster care, you're not likely to go to college. You are more likely to die than go to community college. You are more likely to get sex trafficked or go to jail than go to community college. That is a choice. We can make a different choice, but we must support social workers who are the only folks there ready, willing, and able to escort them to that finish line. How? I once asked my sister, Jessica, she's a social worker, Jessica, what do you do for a living? Her answer? Paperwork, David. I do paperwork. We have a highly trained, passionate woman with an advanced degree from a prestigious university, and we have her filling out forms. What if we unlock her to do her job? And every time there's a tragedy, what do we do to these mostly women? We attack them, like the villagers in Frankenstein, with pitchforks. We need to put down our pitchforks. We need to support them with enhanced compensation. Let's give them interest-free home loans. Let's waive tuition costs for their children at universities and colleges. And let's modernize the tools they use to do their job. Every time my sister walks into a home, she has to enter what she sees into 10 different databases. What if instead she took a photo and it uploaded automatically? What if the courts, the schools, probation, all of those systems, data systems, interlocked, and my sister, at the touch of a fingertip, could have the data she needs to do her job and to serve us by serving these children? We can make that choice. Other than the laws of physics, everything is a choice. We can choose to end this pipeline of poverty to foster care to poverty by investing in the foster care system today. We can recruit more middle-class foster parents by bringing down the financial barriers that prevent them from stepping up. We can support foster youth as they emancipate with every opportunity for a future by building dorms at community colleges. And finally, we can support social workers by respecting them, enhancing their compensation, and modernizing the tools that they need to do their jobs effectively. Ella Fitzgerald, Maya Angelou, Larry Ellis, Coco Chanel, Cher, all of these people were foster youth. We are living in the world that we have invented. We can unlock the potential for every foster child. We can end child poverty by investing in the system. But we must make that choice today, now, you.